he just pointed at me, it's time to start. Uh, Will usually welcomes you to the Miller Center, but since he's sitting behind me, I'm going to welcome you to the Miller Center today on behalf of the entire Miller Center apparatus. Uh, we, usually, <laughs> we usually both welcome you, but this time we'll have to have one welcome suffice. Uh, I'm Gary Gallagher. I'm a member of the Corcoran Department of History at the University of Virginia and a senior faculty associate here at the Miller Center. And I have been in charge of putting together a program of speakers on the American presidency and crises in the 19th century, which has been going on for 15 months. Uh, this will be the closing session of this, uh, of this program that we've had for 15 months. I'll tell you very briefly of what we've done before we got here today. We started with a conversation last fall between Jim McPherson and me on Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis as commanders in chief uh, during the American Civil War. Uh, Daniel Walker Howe then talked about James K. Polk and the war with Mexico. And Bill Brands then talked about uh, Andrew Jackson and the troubled birth of democracy, as he put it, those took place last fall. Uh, last spring, Michael Holt began with Franklin Pierce and James Buchanan and the fight over the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He was followed by Joan Waugh, who talked about Ulysses S. Grant and Reconstruction. And Alan Taylor brought last spring's program to a close, talking about uh, <clears throat> James Madison as chief executive during the War of 1812. Uh, this fall, Elizabeth Barron opened our program with a lecture on Andrew Johnson and the constitutional crisis of impeachment. And so here we are this afternoon, and I'm delighted to welcome our ninth participant, Peter Onuf, uh, who is a former colleague in the Corcoran Department of History. He held the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation uh, professorship. Uh, for a number of years. He is a, I'll be honest about this, he's a treasured friend of mine. I'll say that at the outset. More to the point this afternoon, however, he's a scholar whose contributions uh, to the uh, literatures on Thomas Jefferson and the early republic have been quite remarkable. Uh, he's also one of the American history guys. There's another one in the room here, too. He's behind me uh, right over here. Uh, Brian Ballow and Ed Ayers are the other two American history guys who bring a wonderfully rich array of historical insights to a national public radio uh, audience on a regular basis. I'm only going to mention four of Peter's books. He said that I should mention all of those that have union in the title. And I made my list of four, including none of the ones that have union in the title. <laughs> And so I'm going to use my list instead of his. Uh, he, I'm going to use all over the map, a rethinking region and nation in the United States, which he co-authored, came out from Johns Hopkins in 1996. Jefferson's Empire, the Language of American Nationhood, published by the University of Virginia Press in 2001. A nation, Markets and War, Modern History in the American Civil War, which he co-authored with his brother Nicholas G. Onuf, also the University of Virginia in 2006. And finally, because we're talking about Jefferson today, The Mind of Thomas Jefferson, which came out in 2007 uh, from the University of Virginia Press. If you want to mention your other books as we go along, please feel free uh, to do so. <laughs> but I hope you won't. Peter and, I, <laughs> Peter and I are going to bring the program to a close with a conversation similar to the one that Jim McPherson and I used to open this 15-month series. Our topic is Jefferson and the problem of union. So now I'll ask you to welcome Peter Onuf to the Miller Center. <laughs> welcome, Peter. I'm still not going to let him talk, however. I'm going to do a very <laughs> short setup on what we'll do this afternoon. And then once he does start talking, you won't even remember that I'm here. But for now, <laughs> I'm going to do the setup. And I'm, I'm going to start by saying that anyone who hopes to understand the 19th century in the United States has to come to terms with the importance of union as a deeply important concept and highly charged word uh, in the political vocabulary. It's a word that's gone from our political vocabulary now. It literally means nothing to most Americans now, the word union, if it isn't associated with labor. Union in the sense was so important during the 19th century is gone. There were contending understandings of the meaning of union, uh, almost always tied to ideas about liberty and opportunity and frequently enmeshed with beliefs about the place of the institution of slavery 
in the American Republic. All of the individuals who have been the subjects of lectures in this series talked about union, from Madison and other framers of the Constitution uh, who drafted what they thought would lead to a more perfect union, to Andrew Jackson, who very famously referred to union in making a toast while he looked right at John C. Calhoun during the nullification crisis on Jefferson's birthday in 1832. He said, our federal union, it must be preserved, to which, as many of you know, Calhoun replied, the union next to our liberty, uh, most dear. During the election of 1860, when four candidates uh, ran uh, for the presidency under four party standards, all of them talked about union. All of them wanted to be right with union. For Lincoln and most Republicans, the union was a sort of mystical, perpetual, indivisible, eternal thing. Uh, Stephen Douglas, who was the regular Democratic candidate that year, stated over and over that whatever else happened, the union must be preserved after the election of 1860. John C. Breckinridge, who was the Southern Democratic candidate, uh, said the Constitution and the equality of the states are symbols of everlasting union. And the fourth candidate, old John Bell, who ran as the candidate of the Constitutional Union Party, didn't talk about anything else. They didn't even have a platform. Their platform was in their title. It was union and the Constitution. Union comes up so often during this century, which is not Peter's perfect century, but it's his second favorite century uh, after the late 18th century. Lincoln's vision of union rested on free labor and a voice in self-government for common citizens and the potential to rise economically, not the guarantee, but the potential. Jefferson Davis also believed in the union as safeguarding self-government and economic opportunity, but of course he also saw it as guaranteeing slavery and its expansion. Both men celebrated the Declaration of Independence. That is Lincoln's great founding document. In his view, it's the Declaration. Both invoked Jefferson repeatedly and throughout their careers. Jefferson's ideas regarding union were complex and immensely important. We're almost to you, Peter. Uh, they resonated throughout the 19th century on both sides of the Potomac River, or the Ohio, if you prefer. Uh, the United States put Thomas Jefferson on its five-cent stamp in 1856. Only two people preceded Jefferson on stamps in the United States. Jorge, of course, uh, always would have to be one of them. And the other one was Benjamin Franklin. And the Confederacy put him on its 10-cent stamp in 1861. The only person who landed on a Confederate stamp before Jefferson was Jefferson Davis, interestingly enough. This afternoon, Peter and I are going to have our conversation about Jefferson's thinking about union and how his ideas were available for use or misuse uh, by many different people in the decades between 1800 and 1880, Peter. So why don't you talk for a few minutes about Jefferson and union? Just a few minutes. Take as long as you want. We have, it's rainy outside. No one's going to play tennis. Well. I'm a radio star, so I want you all to close your eyes <laughs> and suspend disbelief. Peter has on not only a Jefferson tie, no, you've got to see it, but it's two a, Jefferson pins. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Gary, I'd like to start with a quotation from Jefferson, and it's an interesting one. It's when he's talking about the Declaration of Independence as he's designing a reading list at the University of Virginia. Gary and I used to do this together. We used to teach a course the famous 701. And that reading list included the Declaration, of course. Of course, oh, I didn't write it, the American people wrote it. Uh, I'm just he channeling really it. Believe no, that. no. Well, <laughs> he channeled the American people. Anyway, he said, what is the Declaration? We want Jefferson's simple definition of what the Declaration is all about. He says, it's the fundamental act of union of these states. He says the Declaration gave us union. Now, as Gary said just before, we don't, that word means nothing to us now. What could he possibly have meant? Why did he say it? Why didn't he talk instead about all those wonderful things in the second paragraph? Oh, all men are created equal. You've heard that one, government by consent. The American creed as it's frequently been described. Yet for Jefferson, there is something creedal about union. And what I want to do is to try to put union and 
his vision of Republican government together. Because I think we and many critics in the 19th century dissociated the two. Now you say it's only referring maybe vestigially to what used to be called the labor movement uh, in the 18th century in Jefferson's time and into the 19th century as people criticized the union, they looked at its flaws. People like William Lloyd Garrison said, this is a covenant with death, with hell, this constitution. The union is associated with the constitution, not with the declaration. And the constitution is the beginning of American politics. When we still had political life in this country, Americans celebrated the Constitution as this great reform caucus in action, as one author called it, where sensible, realistic statesmen got together and they crafted the only possible, miraculously, the only possible Constitution that could embrace so many different states, so different labor systems, so much diversity. It was a compromise, in other words, as Garrison suggested, to have union, you had to compromise. Any good historian will tell you that's exactly the point of the union right now. That's not what Jefferson meant by union, though. For him, it was the coming together of self-governing republics, which in, its, in and of itself, the fact that the states had their own constitutions, were governing themselves, what a tremendous breakthrough for mankind, this idea of self-government, and then showing their genius for union in the creation of new state governments, the first peoples in the modern world who governed themselves, then they built on that to create yet a more all-embracing union. Union was part of the unfolding of the Republican vision. There would be future unions. The union would expand. The union was dynamic. The union was processed. The union was a movement toward a better world because what it demonstrated, we've talked about equality. We know how important that is. We're all equal. But what is the point of equality? It enables you to consent. You can't consent if you're not equal. And what do you consent to? You consent to that which enhances the welfare of mankind. Because suddenly the people are governing themselves. They're not under the heel of despots and tyrants. Now self-government. And I want to tell you this, my fellow Americans. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting worked up now, you can tell. Have a sip of water. I, I better. <laughs> Americans, you're just going to have to wait a minute. <laughs> Democratic government, hold on to your seats, is an engine for moral progress. I'm channeling Jefferson, I'm channeling the enlightenment, the democratic enlightenment. Once the people rule themselves, government will improve. We will no longer have coercive, despotic governments. We will be governing ourselves. And where do we take you our You can't cue? have a real union if there's any coercion That's involved. That's absolutely right. That's why this is foundational. It's a point we're going to come back to, I think, Gary, and that is Maybe that sooner than you think, but go really? ahead. Really? <laughs> Everything happens. We may, not be line. Line. we may not be linear here this afternoon. It may be sort of stream of consciousness, but go ahead for now. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to make it quick. I want to get this So it's out. a process. Yeah, it's a process. Don't think of union as a fixed thing. It's not perfect. You heard what Madison said, what they said about the federal constitution, more perfect. Suggesting it's not most perfect, it's not perfect, it's getting better. Because we don't understand yet what nature's God enjoins, but we're figuring it out. I don't know if anybody out there is into natural religion and acknowledges nature's God unless you're a Unitarian. Though they don't talk about nature's God in Unitarian churches. I know I'm a lapsed Unitarian. Can you be a lapsed Unitarian? I, <laughs> <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> this is what you get. But from what you're saying, let me, let me 
push you on something else right here. If this is a process and it's mm -hmm. things are going toward, with any luck, something that's even better, did Jefferson right. think this could only be, I mean, the, the Union became very much an exceptionalist right. concept yeah. by the mid-19th century. Yeah. Is it that way well, in, there was, in Jefferson's mind, or could this happen yeah, somewhere there else? There was an exceptional dimension. You know, the city on the hill idea that we've heard from Ronald Reagan as he was channeling John Winthrop, that idea that the United States is an exemplary nation, the example suggests that others can follow, but follows the key word. They will become more enlightened in the fullness of time. What's remarkable about the American people is, and these are the people who made the revolution, is that they, they're all literate, mostly, except in places like Virginia, just joking. I come from New England. I can't help it. Uh, they're largely literate. New England uh, used to be important, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's reenact the sexual crisis here. <laughs> Colorado boy. Colorado didn't exist, okay? All right, moving on. <laughs> it actually did exist. New England just hadn't named it yet, so they didn't think it existed. Oh. <laughs> All right. You know now why the union failed. But... <laughs> All right, so where was I going with this? I had asked you whether Jefferson's notion was an exceptionalist notion oh, yeah. of what was happening okay. in the colonies at yeah. that point, because uh, it became very much that. Right. Uh, and Jefferson does think that the Americans have a unique opportunity to govern themselves because they are literate in the broadest sense of the word. They're civically competent. There's been a high degree of local autonomy and self-government in the colonies. And the revolution itself is testimony to the fact that Americans are conscious of their rights and willing to fight for them. Because this was a people's war. Now, I don't believe all this, but I'm just channeling Jefferson. And Lincoln called the right. Civil War a people's contest. And that's the important thing, because that is the principle of Republican government. We now have abandoned notions that we have little gods on earth, kings, who give rule to us, who are our political fathers, without whom we could not exist. We have abandoned the great chain of being that suggests that some are born to rule and others are born to be ruled. What a magnificent idea, but what a scary idea in the 18th century when the people are basically considered, and I'm now quoting Abigail Adams, rubbish. I just happened to be reading her recently, but it's a common way of referring to ordinary people, the hoi polloi, the scum. Lincoln and many other the unionists demons. in the mid-19th century would have said nothing had really changed, that the rest of the world still didn't think that ordinary people were capable of self-government. I think that's a key point when we compare Lincoln and Jefferson on union. Uh, Lincoln sees that this is the last best hope of mankind. You might say that Jefferson sees it as the first best hope for mankind. That is, he has an enlightenment idea that it will spread, light will spread. It, it, it's almost a metaphor that's natural. It suggests as the day dawns and as the light spreads across the land, people can see clearly. That notion of seeing clearly is very important. And the people are capable of seeing what they need to see, what they need to see to govern themselves. You don't have to be, as we say now, a nuclear physicist. You just have to be a Democrat, not a, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> it was, this is, I'm sorry out there, yeah. The, 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 what about the notion of the union being perpetual yeah. that, that, that was so important by the mid-century to people who saw all of these qualities in union that made yeah. the United States exceptional? That's a great point, that, that point about perpetuity. The only thing that Jefferson thought should be perpetual were the fundamental principles or ideas on which the union was based. And let me put it this way. We're going to get into this, uh, this complicated development that's really important over time. I want to introduce the key to Jefferson's thinking about union, and that's federalism. Uh, and Jeffersonian federalism is not what we have today. You have to understand that his conception of political authority, legitimate political authority, begins in the family. 
Uh, we talk about family values today, but for Jefferson, the family was the, the foundational republic on which larger republics would be built. I think it's important to get this down because it's going to explain, I think, a lot of things that happened over the 19th century. For Jefferson, federalism culminating in the Union and perhaps in an expanding Union, perhaps even a Union of Unions that will cover the world, begins literally at home. In that foundational Union of man and wife, the creation of a family which the, is the incubator of Republican citizens in the next generation. Families combined together for Jefferson had New England envy. Gary obviously doesn't. He wished Virginia had towns. What do we have in Virginia? What did we have in Virginia? Counties in which local oligarchs self-appointed themselves and gave rule through parish vestries, through county courts, the only representative institution was the House of Burgesses. And those elections, 90% of them weren't contested, and the ones that were contested were drunken brawls, because that's the way you treated voters. The pretty sorry story, and Jefferson was familiar with this. He said what we need are towns so that the families, the fathers, can get together. And then on top of the towns, the counties. And then we go to a higher level, to the states and then to the union, the federal union. Here's the key idea, Gary, I'm gonna throw this back at you. Equality is crucial. We talked before about you can't have consent without equality. And you every- You cannot have coercion. No, or it's no not a coercion. Union. Every level of union, whether it be on the town level, the union of families, or the county level, the union of towns, those unions exist to preserve and perpetuate the equality of their constituent units. Do you follow me? That's pretty straightforward. In other words, the legitimacy, the value of the union of the town is that all families will be treated equally and have an equal voice in their own government. And you move up the ladder, that imperative remains. And that is, union depends on preserving the equality of constituent units because otherwise, some are benefiting at the expense of other. That's another way of some saying that some are ruling the others. You know, the great problem with union throughout our periods is the fear that it's going to be captured by the bad guys. And one thing Americans produce in great abundance is bad guys. Well, this problem, though, of equality within the union, did you have another, did, did I step on your punchline there? No, I was waiting for a big response. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are you going to respond? <laughs> I don't think they're going to. <laughs> the, the one thing that, for example, John C. Calhoun wrestled with, with mm -hmm. how do you maintain what he would have called equality, equal treatment in all the ways that matter within mm -hmm. a union where demographics were tilting power toward the non-slaveholding states. That's, that's, of course, the great nightmare of the, of the slaveholders and their need to control, in fact, to capture, which is precisely what they did because the federal government was dominated by slaveholders throughout its existence up to the Civil War. So much so that by the time Lincoln comes along and says, well, maybe we should agree not to let the area of the slave states expand, then that's too much. That's violating the basic idea of union. Here's the problem, and I think it's what we would try to reconcile as we talk about the problem of union. How can you have equality, or liberty you might put it, autonomy, independence, and union? Is there a tension between them? And that's what I mean by... And where do compromise... What's the line between compromise and coercion? What they would have argued about that, too. You say you're compromising, and I'm saying, no, no you're... Okay, what, what I would suggest to you, Gary, and I'm going to try to channel Jefferson here, is that the way we resolve such quarrels is that public opinion becomes progressively more enlightened. And that's what's so hard for us to believe in an era in which 
public opinion doesn't become more enlightened. That's that, the or idea of an organic developing union, too. It's going to, that that's would right. be part and of it. That's right, and it too. will expand. And the idea that expansion means balancing free and slave states, that's insane because Jefferson honestly believes that slavery will eventually disappear. And why is it going to disappear? Not because of economic forces and market forces. Not, It's going to disappear because people are going to see that it's wrong. Remember, the revolution was against despotic authority. And Jefferson doesn't have a great record on race and slavery. I can tell you that right now. We can talk more about it if you like. But he does believe that the fundamental teaching of the revolution, the basic principle of Republican government, is equality, it's not coercion, it's consent, and slavery eventually, that contradiction between a republic of slaveholders and the Athenian mode is going to become too striking, too conspicuous, and Americans will see it's in their best interest. He would, have, would he have argued for equality among the white citizenry, or would he have included everybody? No. Not he everybody. clearly wouldn't have included no, everybody. Uh, the, the, the short answer on this, as you know, is that uh, for Jefferson, the idea of uh, the way he thinks about slaves is as a captive nation, held unjustly. This is important. Slaves don't deserve to be slaves. They're not naturally slaves. They are slaves because of, well, Jefferson would like to blame George III and his predecessors for sanctioning the slave trade. We have them but it is an evil institution, it's unjust. The solution is to end the state of war that is slavery. It is a state of war, it's a cold war of a violent, coercive institution, the very antithesis of Republican government. In fact, his big concern about slavery is that young men in Virginia will grow up in a world of slaveholders and that will be their school. They don't have public schools in Virginia in the antebellum period. Instead, they're gonna learn how to be slaveholders. They're gonna learn how to tyrannize people who are older than they are. People as old as we are. Kids, because of race privilege, because they're white. That's horrible from Jefferson's perspective. And what we need to do is break the chains, emancipate the slaves, and send them someplace else. So he would have seen a union down the road eventually that would have been a union where black people would have been removed from this they union. They would have been removed. And you know, he ultimately, this is in the best of all possible worlds, and Jefferson's a patient guy. It could take generations, because he's not gonna happen in his lifetime. He keeps pushing the date off. But eventually, people will see the light and emancipate slaves and send them, well, he doesn't know where. Maybe the West Indies, maybe West Africa, but in the best of all possible future worlds, the former slaves, the freed people will govern themselves. And then as an independent self-governing people, they can form unions, a union among the enlightened Republican nations of the world. We can divide black and white so that one day we can unite. Lincoln embraced yeah, colonization as well, colonization. Until, until deep it, into the Civil it, War. It didn't it let go of it till 1864. It makes given the depth of what we call race prejudice. But what I want to suggest is the way race and nation are synonymous terms. And he's, Jefferson's really thinking geopolitically about warring nations. And all the things he says about slavery grow out of his wartime experience. Slaves are dangerous to the future of the Republic because they're a fifth column, because when they have the opportunity, and this is how slavery has ended throughout the world, in wartime, they will seize it. Nothing is more, nothing destabilizes slavery the way a, a war destabilizes slavery, whether it's the revolution Which, why it's, or it's, the war of 1812 along the Chesapeake, right. as Alan has showed us, or the Civil War where the armies are great engines of emancipation right. moving into the Confederacy. Right. It's right. the worst thing that can happen right. to a slaveholder's world. Right. So uh, Jefferson does believe in the separation of the races. Uh, for Native Americans, they can become civilized. They can become white, in other words, and they can adopt farming ways and become, uh, become effectively whites. Because after all, all good Virginians would probably have a few in the room from the first families. 
got to be careful in crowds like this. Uh, you're all descended from Pocahontas, if I'm not mistaken. I'm a 19th century guy. I have no idea what, uh, <laughs> what was going on with Pocahontas. And that <laughs> that's so early. <laughs> it's not really that, my period. It, it's very early. Many people, as we move through the 19th century, would use Thomas Jefferson and would, and would use him in the sectional debates right. to buttress arguments for state rights within right. a system, within a union that has become unbalanced as a central government is threatening rights of the constituent parts. And they look to the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. How sure. would, what would Jefferson say about that? Well, he wasn't in his grave yet during the Missouri controversy of 1819-21, but he did some turning over nonetheless, uh, because uh, when it looked like the union would fall apart, I don't know if you all know about the Missouri controversy, it was whether or not Virgi uh, uh, Missouri would be admitted as a slave state to the union. It ultimately was in tandem with the free state of Maine, one of the great states of, of uh, our union. Alan, shout out to you. Um, but this argument about the future of slavery was one that looked like it was creating a line of separation between those states with slaves and the so-called free states. And that fear of the capture of the federal government was intense for Jefferson. Jefferson's position was in effect, oh, give us time and we'll deal with our domestic Keyword: domestic institution. It's none of your business. And eventually we'll deal with it. But when you threaten to destroy the union, which is what he thinks the restrictionists in the Missouri controversy, that is Northern Republicans, people in Jefferson's own party who, and former Federalists who are pushing for a limit on slavery. And of course, that's the trigger issue throughout the antebellum decades, a limit on the expansion of slavery. Those people mean to seize power, the restrictionists, and subject the southern states to a colonial provincial status. They will be creatures of a strong federal government. Whenever that happens, people start talking about it. that's the return of the British Empire. This is evil, a dominant metropolis uh, destroying our liberties. You can see from Jefferson's logic why he would be so acutely sensitive to threats to the equal status of the southern states. Because what he says to the restrictionists in the Missouri controversy is you're telling us that we don't have Republican governments, that we're not perfect republics because we have slaves. Well, most states, even the North, still have slaves. But that your commitment to the institution of slavery makes you less than a republic. And the guarantee clause of the Constitution, according to the restrictionist, Article 4, Section 3, guarantees Republican government to all the states. And so now you're saying all states are not created equal. There are the real republics, that is the northern states that are getting rid of slavery, and then there are these slave-holding hybrids. And hybrids weren't a good thing in those days. In the, in the, in the, in the South. So that, that notion of equality is really crucial. What I want to suggest, Gary, and I talk about that federalism business, look forward and outward with Jefferson from the founding of the Republic, and federalism looks like the secret. It's going to unfold. The whole world will one day, one day be embraced by this Republican vision. It's the means by which we have it both ways, which is what all good Americans want. But it only want. works if you really find a balance between the center and the localities. Right. And you all ultimately have to share the same set of beliefs. And this may be the ultimate naivete of the Enlightenment project, that I'll tell you what the key beliefs are. They are equality, consent, that, that those ideas that we still cherish. We all agree on that. Remember, it's the declaration we're celebrating, not the Constitution. It's the declaration that Jefferson Davis referred to when he said all the southern states are doing is asserting their right to self-determination That's right. in 1860-61. Yeah, he's drawing on, on Jefferson's inspiration. There's no question about that. 
But what I would say to you, Gary, is that uh, the collapse of the Union, I talked about Jefferson turning over prematurely in his not yet grave. Um, if the Union splits, then the revolution was pointless. Then the United States is pointless. And I'll tell you why. Because as soon as you break up the Union, well, what's to stop the fragmentation from continuing? Well, it will continue. It that's will continue. What, that's what Lincoln would have what said. What do but... you get when you get a disunited states? You take union for granted now. We don't divide along sectional lines anymore. Well, what we do actually, but on a micro level, I've been taught there are a lot of blue people in the red states, and they're really blue these days. Just, I don't think that's... many people actually believe in secession anymore. No, uh, I that's... think secession's not a problem. <laughs> but here's the, here's the dilemma. It's the collective security problem. In an anarchy, which is the technical word, an anarchy of uh, independent polities, at whatever level we achieve some kind of temporary equilibrium, those states are in a state of nature with regard to each other, which means a state of war. That's what a state of nature is. They may not be fighting but one day they will. During the period of the founding in the 1780s, this was the great argument. You need to strengthen the union and make it more perfect, lest the United States become disunited and become an image of Europe. Why did we even bother to try to form a new nation if the best we can do is create a knockoff version of Europe? Pretty pathetic because we'll be at war with each other. And guess what happens when there's war, my fellow Republicans, with a small r? When there's war, you have to exercise power. It ex exaggerates executive power, military power. You get military industrial complexes. Nations at war are nations that have a, a lot of problems with liberty because all you liberty lovers out there are a bunch of subversive terrorists. We have to suppress you. It's wartime, okay? You follow me? So you need to preserve. I'm trying to keep up. Yes, I am. <laughs> right. I just was trying to explain that simple point why peace is so Peter important. Peter and I talked yeah. together for years, and I'm having little flashbacks as we go along here. <laughs> he is not going to send me out of the room as he did during one of our seminars. This, this is my time. Only for 10 minutes, yes. <laughs> and then he came back, just like the states did uh, after Appomattox, which leads me to my next question. Oh, right. If a union cannot involve coercion, mm -hmm. then how would Jefferson have looked at the resolution of the American Civil War? Is that still a worthwhile union that is put back together after this? Not that he's against bloodletting. Yeah, the yeah. French Revolution oh, didn't bother him. He, he was happy to see rivers of blood. Rivers of blood. Rivers of blood, baby, let him go. But, but this is a lot of blood right. in the American Civil War, right. a reconstituted union that right. Lincoln would have said, of course, is the union. It's an improved one. What would his yeah. response to that be? Well, you know, I think Lincoln could have persuaded him maybe that it was a good thing. The problem is that the union that Lincoln celebrates, and I would like to hear what you say about this, Gary, the union that your men, your people, the in winners. the North, the winners, the good <laughs> folks, the good guys, all right? The Colorado <laughs> counties are named after Union generals. All right. Unlike counties in New England. Because <laughs> <laughs> our counties were already named by yes, that point. after tired you know, old, yes, go yeah, ahead. Okay. <laughs> Think about it for a minute. The Union that Lincoln wants to preserve, that's a perfect thing that needs to be preserved. He's not looking forward to expansion. In fact, the Republican party platform, party platform is to end expansion if it means more slave states. Well, it means to end expansion of slavery. It doesn't mean to end right. expansion of the nation. Well, it probably does because of the political impasse, doesn't it? Um, I don't know. But uh, the, the union is perfect. It needs to be preserved. And I think something has happened to the idea, which is what I'm getting at. Rather than looking forward expansively, we are now protecting a great nation dominant in its continent, 
even prospectively in its hemisphere, this, is, this great nation has a manifest destiny, as people like to say in the antebellum decades. We squander that great advantage. We forfeit it. We risk a relapsing into despotism in a state of war. We need to preserve this thing. It's sacred, but there is an element to this, and I'm, I'm trying to work this out with you, an element of a, a static quality to it. Well, it's Lincoln, something if, to be. I it's, think if you read Lincoln early in the Civil War, you might get a more of a sense of its being static, but he would have talked about getting rid of slavery is improving the Union. It is an improved Union at the end. Yeah, it's no, the kind of Union that Jefferson would have agreed with from what that, you say I, is his long-term vision. Right. I think that's right. Particularly, you've talked about Lincoln as a colonizationist. He is not eager to integrate. Uh, he wants to preserve. He, he didn't think yeah. his, his experience in Illinois and Indiana and Kentucky convinced him it was right, impossible. Right, right. So I, I think that's right. But and he that's is why, beyond that by the end of the Civil yeah, War. Yeah, and I, I, I do think what motivates Lincoln is both a sense of that great destiny for the nation, the fact that it is a republic is important. Uh, I think Lincoln's great service to Jefferson is to redeem him. Uh, there is a dimension of Jefferson's thinking that's captured in Lincoln's apotheosis of Jefferson in the Gettysburg Address and elsewhere. Uh, this republic needs to be preserved, as we said before, for Lincoln, the last best hope of mankind, for Je Jefferson, more hopeful, perhaps, uh, the first best yeah. hope. Yeah, but I gather from some of the things you've said about Jefferson that he really did believe that if things didn't work out, in the, that perhaps some unions would fail and maybe other ones would rise. Lincoln really didn't believe that. He really believed if this one failed, then yeah. the ideas of self-government and of economic opportunity would simply be gone, yeah, and, and the forces of oligarchy would have reasserted themselves. Uh, I think uh, Lincoln and Jefferson agree on this, and uh, Jefferson's response to the Missouri controversy is, if we can't find an equitable compromise, some way that respects the rights of all the member states, if we can't be reassured about that, then all hell will break loose. As I said, there's no point to this experiment in Republican government. It failed, that's a key word. Experiment. Experiment. These are natural philosophers. We call them scientists. Scientists of government. It's the founders. It's the way we like to think about them, particularly political theorists, that this is a great seminar at the Constitutional Convention. They're coming up with this brilliant plan, and they're going to see how it works. Well, maybe it doesn't work. Maybe the experiment fails. What does that say about the future of mankind? How can you sustain an enlightened view of progress what Lincoln does is what Jefferson believed would happen naturally, but it didn't, namely the end of slavery. And uh, coercion force was needed to do that. Uh, and that is a tragic failure from Jefferson's perspective. But the rupture of a union, let them go? How long would that last? That's a tragic failure as well. Perhaps a greater failure, because at least if you preserve the shell of the Union, perhaps it can rehabilitate itself. Perhaps free government can reemerge in the wreckage of the old Union. How upset do you think he would have been, he being Jefferson, have been at some of the constitution, questionable constitutional actions that Lincoln took in order to save the Union but that seemed at odds with the spirit and the letter of the Constitution. Yeah, well, there are two ways to think about it. I think the, the, the better way is to think about the way Jefferson uses executive power himself. Uh, and that is, Jefferson does not fetishize the Constitution. He doesn't say that my hands are bound because of the Constitution, because there is something greater than the Constitution at stake and that is the very existence of the United States of America. The first law of nature, and remember, I invoked nature's God, natural religion, natural philosophy, the first law of nature is self-preservation. The nation fails, the nation dies, then the Constitution is a museum piece. 
You can put it on a shelf in the library and read it at your leisure. If we but don't it's win the dead. war, Lincoln said, what exactly the Constitution right. means nothing That's if right. we lose the war. Right. So he would have, you think Jefferson would have thought, okay, you have your priorities in order there. You know, I think Union looks different looking forward, looking back. So does the idea of the nation. And I think it's implicit in Jefferson's thinking about the American people as being dedicated to liberty and having does this. Link, does, does Jefferson link union and nation in his mind? By the time of the Civil War, they're deployed interchangeably by many people yeah. who love the nation, country, United States, union, often in the same yeah. paragraph. They'll <laughs> drop all of them in. That's, that's, that's a wonderful question. It's hard to answer because I think the idea of a nation is implicit in the very notion of popular sovereignty and self-determination. That is an idea of, a, of the people as a kind of organic whole, a great family of families. I talked about the importance of family before. But by the time we get to Lincoln at mid-century and beyond, this is the great period of romantic nationalism. And there's something about the nation as its organic whole that supersedes, subsumes, and subsumes individuals, it subsumes everything. Your identity is a national identity. It trumps everything else. This, well, for some people. For some people. Or for you know, many people, in a, So we don't want to exaggerate it because Lincoln is not about to abolish states, uh, though you'd love to abolish those southern states. Uh, he believes in the federal distribution of authority. Uh, he believes in the, the compromises that were worked out in the Constitution. All that's important to him. But the most important thing is the dedication to that shared principle, commitment to Republican government, that makes us one people. Jefferson would be reluctant to make that final move toward that great superhuman thing, the nation. And we are libertarian Americans hold on to notions that are at odds with that. Where would he have come down on the argument about the origins of the union? Does the union, does the, the, does the union arise from the people or mm -hmm. does it arise from the colonies slash states? Yeah, I'm gonna throw you uh, another possibility. Uh, Fire away. All right, well, enlightened philosophers, statesmen like Jefferson are famous for looking forward to a better future. But you can't look forward without looking backward. And when Jefferson tried to define what liberty was, he looked back to the beginnings of historic time. He looked back to Saxon liberties. He looked back to the original social contract. He also looked back to the British Empire. And this is my answer to you. And it complicates that notion of states' rights being foundational because the states are, in the context of the British Empire, a joke. Let me tell you why. They are not independent polities. They are free riders on imperial protection. Americans love their kings. They are monarchists until they're not, until they become Republicans because their king is making war against them. What Americans want, and I think this is the deep model for Jefferson's commitment to union, what the Americans want is their version of the British Empire. One in which you can have it always. You can have local liberty. You can have courts responsive to local juries. You can determine land policy within your colony. You can determine labor systems within your colony. You have trading opportunities with the emporium of the planet. You are enriched by the imperial connection and you are free riders on the collective security afforded by the military and naval might of the British Empire. That's what you want, only now you're gonna call it something different. You're gonna call it Republican. You're gonna say, it doesn't come from any king. It comes from us, the people. We can do this without the king. But the predicate of doing it without the king is to form a union among those former provinces. George Washington. That's been a, this is, I'm fascinated by all this. Now, are you going to answer my question? 
which, <laughs> which are would you accusing be, me if, of being unresponsive? If he were, I no, I'm, th 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 I'm accusing you of being yourself, which is one of the things I really like about you. You often spin off in directions and people wonder. But, but that I was just good about you, the empire, right? It was just, it was, I was transfixing. But let me, <laughs> let me bring you back. If we put it to Mr. Jefferson, mm. whether the union derived from the people or from the states, Put it within those terms. We're not, we're not in the empire anymore. We've already settled okay, that. Uh, that, okay. that. That, I think, is the template. And you'll grant that. I've already granted it. Oh, okay. Uh, and I'll give you another answer. That's, You're I, on the I, clock. I, <laughs> <laughs> Gary, I've been talking about nature, nature's God. Yeah, I've been right here. Well, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you for being there for me, Gary. It is nature's decree that this continent be the domain of this great free people. Yes, the states are the instruments of rule, of land policy, of labor policy. They do the important things that we need domestically, but we need a strong union so that we can dominate the hemisphere, if not the world. We have to be strong and we have to be united to be strong. So the answer is both. It is a people that is a product of and relates to that great land and territory. This is, let me coin this phrase, nature's nation. Nation, people, those are synonymous terms. Nature's people. The first people in modern history who conform this is hard for us environmentalists to take seriously, but the first people in modern history who have ruled themselves in accordance with nature's laws and therefore have exploited the great riches available through the improvement of nature. Now, we think nature, nature should be uh, saved from improvers and developers because we have rather different ideas today about how Gaia is uh, I brought that up for you, Brian. How Gaia is at risk, that great throbbing organism of which we are all a part. Of for I thought we were all part of the Oversoul. Oh, you're so 1840s. <laughs> 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 okay, do you, you follow what I'm getting at? So to, to, to say, oh, people, what? The American people? Yeah, I'd say at the end of the day, Jefferson would. I mean, he doesn't, would say, yes, the American people. That's, that, that was a short answer. <laughs> so once again, he agrees with Lincoln, or Lincoln agrees with him, I, I, think I would so. say. I think so, I think so. But I want, okay, let's come back. You brought up something else that I want to pursue, another thread I want to pull here, and that is in terms of the, exp I mean, the union is going to expand. Its, it's natural mm -hmm. future would be expansionist. Right. What would Jefferson, what, did Jefferson believe that, that peoples who did not look like Western Europeans or Englishmen could be brought in as, as really functioning parts of the Union? What would he have thought of incorporating all the people who lived in the half of Mexico that the United States annexed in 1848? Yeah. Uh, I, I think it was a, uh, would have been a real problem for him given the state of political and civic development in what we now call Latin America. And he... Uh, he wouldn't have said they were real republics, even though no, they called themselves no. republics. Uh, national self-determination, a kind of spurious faux national liberation, antedates uh, the democratization of the people. There's no capacity in those peoples. That's why he predicts there will be military dictatorships. They're only used to Long-term Spanish rule, long-term right. Catholic rule would make it impossible and in his view. That, that was his, and, and, and for North America, of course, the wonderful thing about North America is that it was virgin land. Uh, as he says, yeah, I'm stop laughing. Uh, as he says in his inaugural address, he says there's land enough for the thousandth to the thousandth generation of Americans out there. It's tabula rasa, it's a blank space. Of course, he knows that you're gonna have to displace a few Indians, assimilate a few others, uh, there, there are plenty of people out there, but in his vision, there is this inexorable progress of civilization against barbarism and savagery, submitting, subjecting the land to higher use 
yielding more from it. What's wrong with Native American societies is they don't reproduce enough. They don't reproduce enough because Native men aristocrats spend all their time hunting and abusing their women. Uh, so they'll never move past that static, stable point of barbarism. The future is in the progress of civilization. This is what he embraces and moving across the territory. He doesn't, he's not seized with the kind of collective guilt that comes with the red legend in America, the condemnation of the expropriation of Indian lands and the genocide and destruction of native cultures. That doesn't bother enlightened people. So he would have, he would have accepted territorial expansion into these kinds of places, but then would have pushed for some kind of relocation of the populations? Well, that's what happened. And of course, Andrew Jackson implements. I don't just mean in, yeah. I'm, I'm speaking in terms of right. the acquisitions from Mexico yeah, and from yeah. perhaps other acqui- I think he would say, and this is uh, to give Jefferson his due, he doesn't think that the other peoples of the world, less educated, less developed, maybe not with our exceptional qualities, thinking of Americans as being really with the, the British, and after all, this, these are, this is British America. He does think that the rest of the world one day could catch up. How it would do so? My guess is that he would suggest the emergence over time of confederations in all the populous areas of the world. The progress of Republican government would be fitting. I mean, he. He survived long enough, lived long to enough to see. Take a very long time. Take a long time. Thought, even for the French common yeah. people, he thought they were 200 years behind the common. That's, that was his estimate. He said we got, we're six years behind the uh, cognoscenti in France, but as soon as they publish their books and send them across the ocean, we'll catch up. Uh, but our common people, and this is a vote for democracy, my friends, our common people are 200 years ahead of their French counterparts. 200 years, which Towards to be. Republican. Yeah, well, they yeah. can be Republicans. Jefferson was not optimistic that the French could create a republic, and it seems that they had trouble. Well, they actually created how many republics? Five. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he, Jefferson is both a universalist and an exceptionalist. That's another thing that we have to put into our, uh, another apparent paradox or contradiction we have to resolve. This is a people uniquely capable of governing themselves. Now, in doing so, they demonstrate eternal truths about human nature and human potential that will be fulfilled in the fullness of time across the world. Liz Varon talked about Andrew Johnson and the crisis of constitutionalism and impeachment. Andrew Johnson called himself a Jeffersonian. He Mm -hmm. said that he loved Jeffersonian theory about government, and the bedrock of that was a very small central government, non-intrusive, uh, just did the minimum mm-hmm. uh, that you would want that kind of government uh, yeah. to do. Yeah. And he's used by lots of people who take that view. Yeah. He, well, he's the that's his saying. union. His yeah. union is a union. Well, the idea, Gary, take consent to its logical extreme, and what does it mean? It means that in some ways, enlightened people spontaneously form unions. Uh, Maybe to better understand it, we have to think about the Scottish Enlightenment moral philosophy. We have to think about moral sense, about the new account of human nature that comes out of the Scottish Enlightenment, which is remarkably democratic in its implications. That is, all of us have that kind of moral sense. Now that's crucial for politics, for understanding society itself, because what it means is that we do not have to be ordered, governed, and constrained to do the right thing. Maybe the epitome of this enlightenment hope for mankind, and that's kind of a joke now, but the epitome of it is the very idea of a market, of transactions among equals to which all consent, that are reciprocally beneficial. When you think about the purity, and economists can't get over the purity of their account of the market, it's a beautiful thing to behold. When has it ever really existed in all its beauty? Well, it, no, it doesn't. Only uh, it's, a, it's a fugitive thing, it's an aspiration, it's a hope. But that idea 
that we could be drawn together, not out of sordid self-interest, this is where Mandeville and those uh, uh, economists uh, vulgarize the best of Adam Smith's moral philosophy, we come together to achieve higher things, better things, not only for ourselves, because the first coming together is to form the family for others, for those people who, uh, who we raise, our children. So this, I, and that I think is crucial, for Jefferson is obsessed with generations, with the progress of generations, Things will get better over time. He can't imagine that the rising generation would ever be less enlightened than its predecessor. He can't imagine that people could become ignorant and stupid and selfish. I'm going to pick up on generations, which was one of the <laughs> words that you used just a minute ago. And I'm going to, because I want to bring in each of the other subjects of this lecture series, and U.S. Grant was one of, those, one of those subjects. This is what Grant wrote on the great accomplishment of the Civil War. He said, what saved the Union was the coming forward of the young men of the nation. Mm -hmm. They came from their homes and fields as they right. did in the time of the Revolution, giving everything to the country. Yeah. To their devotion, we owe the salvation of the Union. Mm -hmm. So long as our young men are animated by this spirit, there will be no fear for the Union. Where did where did Jefferson put the citizen soldiers of the Revolution in his calculus oh, of I think credit for the? They're centrally important. Uh, the the idea of the citizen soldier is very much a Jeffersonian coinage. Uh, of course, he didn't actually fight the war. He might not have thought about citizen soldiers in such grandiose terms if he'd been involved in the war more directly. Uh, but he celebrated Could have asked his friend James Monroe. Yeah, a lot of people had, uh, and of course Hamilton was full of contempt for Jefferson because he hadn't put his life on the line. That's what we do, men, right? We're supposed to if we're honorable. Um, but Jefferson, in his uh, inaugural inaugural address, which I think is the central document for understanding this political philosophy, uh, talks about how the United States has, and this is important for you libertarians. He says the United States has the strongest government on earth, which is a remarkable thing for him to say at a time when there are 2,000 people in the army and uh, there's no uh, great uh, uh, government inside or out of sight, doesn't exist. Uh, but he thinks it has enormous strength and what he's talking about, again, so much of the enlightenment vision has to do with potential, what will happen. It's the fact that the revolution was a great moment of mobilization. I think this is what Grant is evoking. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a it's great mobilization, mobilization of the people. And there is nothing stronger, nothing more powerful than a united people at war to preserve the things that matter most to them. That would be their families. That's why apple pie, motherhood, all those things, all those images of why we fight those homely images, that's what makes us powerful. That's the vision that Jefferson conjures up and that Grant uh, echoes. And uh, it's also, you could say, the technology of mobilization in the modern world, getting people to die for you, uh, mastered by the French, perhaps, in the first great levee en masse, but is the definition of modern war, we now have the social technology to get people out to do these things, and if we don't need to kill, or waste our own people's lives, we can do it remotely with drones and things like that. That great force, though, comes from the people. But the force Grant is talking about is not a coerced force. He's talking about, and the, and the majority it's of- not coerced, but it coerces. That's correct, but it's That's not power. coerced. But it is not coerced. There's a draft later in the war, the majority of soldiers right. were volunteers. Yes. And, those, and he's tying them to the revolution yeah. Yeah. and putting them at the center of things. And I think that's right. And that's an interesting thing that at the core of this enduring idea of national power and greatness and liberty, it's people who will sacrifice everything. And then not be liberties. soldiers anymore. That's, that's the key. Right. They're not really they're, soldiers. Right. They're not and they disappear they're, because a permanent military industrial. It's a problem. Because it can be, to repeat this theme again, captured. If it's a technology, a tool, an instrument that can be used by whoever has control of the government, then we're all at risk. 
And I think that's, of course, what we live with in the modern world, is the capacity is now there, and the capacity is not that the young men will rise up like Cincinnati, take their swords, and go to war. The capacity now is much greater than that, and it doesn't rely, well, even on our consent, much less on our active participation. So that image of the citizen soldier is a powerful one, we have to ask, and I think many Americans today do ask, does it describe in any meaningful way who we are as a people today? Well, this citizen soldiery was very different from, I and mean, we have a, a professional right. military now. Yeah. We, and, and that's the sort of antithesis of what Grant's talking about here and what it is. Jefferson would have been you know, talking so about. In some ways, uh, Lincoln and <clears throat> may have preserved and redeemed Jefferson's union by means that Jefferson would have abhorred and seen as a contradiction in terms. Uh, but Grant gives us this notion of a people's war, Lincoln's idea as well. That's, that they're on board, yeah. Uh, and uh, if the people need to fight that war, I think this is the important thing. Jefferson was perfectly willing to fight wars. You had to know who your enemies were. The most horrifying thing is that your enemies are your countrymen. And that was, the, that was the thing that so many Americans had so much difficulty with. And of course, then they... Well, he'd been through, he, that was his yes, war. That's right. You're fighting your countrymen. Right. That, that's the well, revolution, and that is But of course, this. the revolution, they were fighting their countrymen as well. That's it's what I mean. War. It's the that's same, right. it's the same, they're both civil wars. But you need then to identify that thing against which you're fighting, whether it's loyalists, uh, these benighted uh, Anglo-Americans who wouldn't give up on their king, who were cowards, who shirked their duty and responsibility, or at least in the North for a while, you could demonize the slaveholders and the slaveocracy for uh, forcing this war on a liberty-loving people. The War of 1812, you could demonize New England. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> You could. I, we, we said we were going to leave 20 minutes for questions at the end. I have this great digital clock over here. It's 4.38.023. And so I think we will, unless you have a parting thought that you want to. No, too many parting thoughts. Okay, they may come up in the course of questions. But if someone has, if you don't have any questions, we'll keep talking. We're perfectly capable of filling however much time we have. But if you have a question, Raise your hand and someone will appear with a microphone and put it in front of you. And, and this is really problematical, but we... Come on, Mike, you gotta ask Wait. the first question. There's one right behind, there's one right behind you, Stephanie. Oh, I have so many questions. <laughs> but, uh, I, would you identify yourself, please? Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Michael Holt. I'm an emeritus uh, professor in the history department, and I've been in this speaker's series. Um, uh, the, the, the parallel you were trying to draw between Lincoln and Jefferson uh, seems to me off base in this respect, or maybe it's because you didn't mention, uh, mention it at all in your, your presentation of Jefferson's definition of republicanism. Sure. For Lincoln and for Republicans of the 1850s, the basic principle of republicanism was the majority rules. And the minority has to acquiesce in that majority rule. This is what Lincoln said in his message mm -hmm. to Congress. Right. You cannot just quit if you lose an election. What did Jefferson think about the idea of majority rule, oh, which runs mother, against yeah. equality? That's a great question, Mike. It's the mother principle of republicanism. The question, and the, the devil is in the details, majority of whom? And if it's a national majority to uh, aggregate it to bring in uh, Lincoln to the presidency, and it is interpreted as uh, a move that's going to lead to the loss of liberty or rights on the state level, those majorities on the state level will no longer be capable of enjoying and exercising their rights. In other words, it's the assumption that, and this was always a problem, it's why you had to orchestrate the machinery of the federal system to make sure you never had 
something like this happen. That is, a, uh, a, a Lincoln. You had to achieve a kind of balance, which of course was a balance that favored slaveholders. Let's be honest about it. You had to sustain that balance in order to sustain the illusion that this was the kind of union that the founders imagined. But don't you, well, uh, uh, I was just thinking, uh, and you talked about the importance of Jefferson's first inauguration. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you think that if we're all Federalists, we're all Jeffersonians, uh, the point is to tell the Federalists to get over it, uh, that you may have lost, but we're no threat. Oh, the worse than that, he says, the Federalists, how does he define Federalism when he, at the, in the rest of the address, he says, Federalists are people who believe in states' rights. He just turns it on its head. It, it, this is not conciliatory. He says, we won't persecute the leaders of the Federalists. We'll just make laughing stocks out of them. Because they will not, they'll lose their support. So uh, majority rule is foundational. Uh, no question about it. But the great problem, and Gary was alluding to this, that's why I was so difficult to pin down on the states and people business. That's the problem in a nutshell. Uh, Jefferson wants it both ways, majority rule on all levels. We're expecting questions at some point that don't come from the Corcoran Department of History, but for now we'll have our second question. Oh, I'm, I'm Brian Ballow and I direct the <laughs> National Fellowship Program here at the Miller Center. Does that count, Gary? And I'm also a professor in the history department and, here at UVA. And, and one of the and a co-host with Peter. Backstory with the American History guys. Uh, Peter, I, I'm getting in many more words this way than I do on the radio show. So this is <laughs> this is this is really terrific. No, uh, we have callers all the time. <laughs> I want to take you back to your definition of federalism, uh, which begins in the family. Mm. And Gary pressed you on the ability of Jefferson's notion of union to accept others into it as it moves forward. Uh, I want to take you back to the family and Jefferson's understanding of the relationship between a husband and wife, mm -hmm. for instance, and his vision as to how that would progress towards equality. No, it wouldn't. The didn't think I could. <laughs> no, no, uh, okay, I feel compelled to explain that answer. Uh, Jefferson uh, was a self-defined patriarch. Uh, the uh, form of government at the family level is the form of government that's projected onto a whole kingdom, but it is confined as nature means it to be confined to the family where there is, according to nature, a division of labor. And just as uh, uh, there must be a single voice with respect to the larger world representing that unit, whether it's a representative or the father, the father is the representative, he must have authority over uh, his own domain. There's a wonderful quotation from Jefferson's writings in 1816 in which he talks about the series of from the ward to the county on up, but he goes backwards to the plantation or farm itself where nobody has a right to interfere in the affairs of the farmer or planter on his own property. Don't mess with it. That's his way of protecting slavery. Uh, that's the practical implication of it. But the principle is the principle this is the foundation, a foundation, a hard foundation where there's no ambiguity about who rules as there is in modern American families. Instead, it's absolutely clear. You can build on those rocks. That's a solid foundation. And that's nature that decrees that, in case you wondered. Over your left shoulder, Peter. Uh, I don't know if this is too close. Uh, I'm Corcoran Department history major, class of 71. Is that? <laughs> Is this still too close? That's a healthy difference. Is this still too close? No, we think, that's, we, think, yeah. we think that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I, I wanted to get back to the, uh, the, some of the original premises, far, following on what Brian said, among other things. This notion that, uh, that uh, equality and coercion 
uh, can't coexist. It strikes me that uh, coercion can exist uh, without equality. It, it further strikes me that equality cannot exist without coercion. That at some point a consensus is taken, somebody wins and somebody loses, and there's coercion. And going back to what Brian said, it starts in, the, in Jefferson's family, in his world, mm -hmm. uh, the, the male role, and, and probably his concept of the, the extent of geographic coercion might include the Tidewater, the Piedmont, and perhaps the Valley, valley because that was his country, mm -hmm. probably until he was Minister Plenipotentiary. That's right. how he saw right. himself. Right. And so I, want, I, and I wanted you to take up the issue of male suffrage. We've talked a lot, a lot about yeah, how yeah. great it was to be white. Let's not assume for any moment that all whites had votes for the first 40, no, 50 years right. here. You had to have 100, ac 100, 100 acres or 25 acres and a house. So yeah. suffrage, coercion, and equality seem to me to go uh, hand in hand ultimately in strengthening a union. That is expanding the suffrage, absolutely. Yeah, yeah and Jefferson very much sees the evolution of the electorate as, as moving toward uh, white manhood suffrage. There's no question about it. His chief complaint about the Virginia Constitution uh, is not only that it lacks local self-government where majorities can be mustered at the local level, uh, but that the Tidewater is badly overrepresented. And to the extent that that is true, then people in the Piedmont and beyond are underrepresented and therefore under the thumb or rule. Uh, and he thinks that needs to be rectified. His progressive ideas about the evolution of Republican government include the broadening of the electorate, uh, the expansion of the union, the creation of new states, which offers new opportunities for families to establish themselves, uh, but the abolition of hierarchies among equals, absolutely, and that a class of whites would be excluded from the suffrage, white males, uh, is intolerable for him. So it's not as if you can freeze frame that moment of 1776, except to the extent that that's the spontaneous outpouring of all men, many of whom couldn't vote, to fight for their the liberty. The convention right. of uh, right. 1829, 1830 right. in Virginia. Thank you. Hi, my name is Fouad Fadel and I have nothing to do with the history department <laughs> or the University of Virginia, other than my love for the Miller Center and our oldest son graduating from the university with a degree in English and history. <laughs> but my question is, uh, with regard to the Civil War, do you think for a moment that if we did not have it, the southern state would eventually uh, relinquish that problem because of the mechanization? No. Th that problem being slavery. Yeah, yeah that's what yeah. he's asking. Yes. Uh, no. We, I think we would have had the ignominious distinction of being the last Western nation to get rid of slavery. We would have been after Spanish Brazil. Cuba. We would have Cuba. been after Brazil because it was thriving was making the transition from cash crop agriculture into all other elements of the yeah. economy by the mid-19th century. It, was, uh, it used to be a sort of comforting notion that slavery was on its way out, but it was not on you its way out. You can tell by the price of slaves on the eve of the Civil War. And one of the problems was uh, would Southerners be able to aspire to slave ownership? Uh, and the price of slaves is the most sensitive indicator of the value, it's literally value, uh, I think it's important to do uh, Lincoln, his credit, and the, his fellow unionists with this vision of Republican government. It's not that it was normative in the 19th century. In fact, you could say things were moving in the other direction. You could say it because they were. They were. <laughs> they they were my, moving in the other direction. You feel bad about the 20th century for which many of you are partially responsible. The really nasty century is the 19th century. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and the, the big bad guys are the Brits. Right, Adrian? We, we talked about but there, that. The, I mean, one measure, one measure of the, the 1860 census is our wonderful friend that tells us all kinds of things about the United States in 1860. And 
That census tells us that wealth <coughs> in slaves was about $3 billion. Wealth in all manufacturing, all railroads put together in the United States was $2.2 billion in 1860. The, the, the amount of wealth controlled by slaveholders was unbelievably large in 1860. And the two wealthiest states per capita in 1860 were South Carolina and Mississippi, which had in common, they were the only states with an absolute majority of enslaved people in 1860. I mean, they're, Slavery was not going anywhere yeah, it was, in the United States. It was States. modernizing, it's, and they, they uh, you know, the insurance companies have been apologizing, travelers and others, uh, for having been implicated in the institution of slavery. Well, they were selling life insurance to slaveholders to insure their very valuable property. All the, the Wall Street people would have been all over this, you know. Uh, this is not a, this, this goes way back. And the uh, 19th century gives us, uh, uh, is moving toward racial hierarchy, toward a conception of what Kipling called white man's burden, that's in the 1890s, he coins that phrase. Uh, and that is this notion that the uh, civilized uh, Nordic types uh, needed to exercise a paternal uh, rule over darker skinned people the idea of natural rights, maybe this is the key thing and the key point about Lincoln and Jefferson, an idea that comes out of the Enlightenment and nearly dies at the hands of people like Jeremy Bentham and others who say natural rights, nonsense upon stilts. It's all power, it's all positive, it's all what you can do and what you can enforce, that force you're talking about. Law is only good if you can back it up. And uh, th this, is, uh, this is not a, a happy time thing pro where we have the race problem in America as Americans understand it. What are you gonna do with all these black people? You got the labor problem in Britain. What do you do with all these uh, massive numbers of uh, Irish people who are out of work? The misery of Manchester. Uh, but of course, hard thinking, realistic 19th century progressive type say, that's just the price of the progress of civilization, which they had their own ways of measuring. It's really a pretty horrible century, and I, I guess the 20th century is bad too, I know. I but, just, I'm not gonna take much more of this attacking the 19th century. <laughs> I about reached my limit. You're, you're gonna make a plea. Natural right. You're gonna make a plea for the 18th century, for oh, God's sake? I'm saying that's the claim you can make through no. Lincoln is that you kept that idea alive of Republican government and natural rights. All men are created equal. That's nothing to us. Now we just, no, well, I don't when, know what we make of it, but what, it meant a lot. When you to lean Lincoln. toward me and point, should I pay extra no, attention? I was, wait <laughs> <laughs> I was pointing over here, this guy over here. Here's one more question right here, and then I think we will have reached our ending point. Martha Williams, history major but not here in New England. All right. Okay, now my question is changing the subject. I learned something new today. I wasn't aware that Jefferson had such a keen sensitivity to the fact that New England had towns and yeah, less so down here. Definitely, yeah, okay. town envy. Well, I want you to yeah. talk, uh, uh, <laughs> since we have such an urban rural divide in our country now, yeah. I'd like you to address the idea of not only New England towns, but in, the, in your day that you're talking about, serious urban culture. Click Quakerly, Philadelphia, big old right, Boston, right. and most dynamic of all, the Dutch influence in New York right. and the highly tolerant society. Yep. It's not as prevalent in the rural areas, and I'd like you to yeah. see what you can well, do about actually, that. Actually, um, uh, it's um, there's a lot of pathos in Jefferson's beliefs in uh, progress, moral progress, economic development. Uh, there's a nice exchange he has with his granddaughter Ellen, who travels to New England, as Billy knows. Uh, and uh, uh, retraces a, a route that her grandfather had taken uh, 30 years earlier in the company of James Madison when uh, northern New England was still pretty much a wilderness, underdeveloped. Uh, Ellen went to these same areas and found it absolutely remarkable. Uh, the roads were good, the hotels were good, the, uh, there was a, a, a church in every town there were schools. Uh, it was the very image of the 
Republican society fulfilled. And the contrast with Jefferson's Virginia at that moment, they commented on this. When you approached Monticello, it was as if you had to make it through these scruffy woods, uh, through a kind of wilderness that wasn't clear whether it had reverted to a, uh, an overgrown area around Monticello. Um, you, you could look from Monticello, you would, see, you would see many farms, but you wouldn't see the kind of uh, landscape, a Republican landscape. And of course, this was uh, at the very time Gary's talking about the prosperity of the institution of slavery, uh, it left an ugly imprint on the land. And Virginia itself at this period was probably best at producing slaves, better at producing slaves than anything else uh, because of there was such a uh, voracious appetite for slaves to the, further to the south. This was not an image of Republican progress. And yes, Jefferson did understand and, and, and uh, uh, see this kind of urbanity. It's not big cities. Big cities are bad. They're sick, nasty places to go to. You'll die. They're unhealthy. But a kind of uh, a, a, a civic landscape, uh, in many ways, New England was perfect except for the New Englanders. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> I'd like to thank you all very much for coming out on a nasty day. You all had a handout on your seats that tells you what's coming up in the 20th century, a version of what we've been doing in the 19th century here. I hope you will attend all of those and remain good friends of the Miller Center and travel home safely. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Peter.